Okay, so last season we ended and we said that we wanted to tell twin stories. I love all of the twin stories that you guys have written in, some fascinating ones, and I can't wait to share those this season. I also love the people who are writing in and they started their journey with us and then stayed with us until they brought their baby home. And they've written in and and said things like, I didn't know where to start. I listened to your podcast and I thought one day when I get my baby, I'm going to write my story in and it's happening. And today we have a story like that. It's so exciting. Mackenzie Ellis is from Charlotte and she wrote in her story and she said, I listened to your podcast while we were considering adoption. It made a huge difference and I'd love to share our story to help others. Thank you for all you do in hosting this podcast. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have gotten our sweet baby. Oh, I love that so much, Mackenzie. Welcome to the show. Thank you. That is such a huge compliment. It really is. Like, this is what I live for. If I can't continue to adopt, then I like to live through you guys that are still adopting and bringing home babies. And it means a lot to me that you were listening to this during a time that we were actually not recording. So to think that we were taking a break and it was still going out to the world to help the community, it just, it really touched my heart and made me feel like God is in this, like he's doing something really great, even though sometimes you have to take a rest or sometimes you're not doing as much as you think. He is the one that's actually taking these stories out. So I love having you on the show. I love our connection. Let's talk about your story. So our story starts in 2015. We were 27 weeks pregnant with our daughter. Um, Super excited, really healthy pregnancy. Everything was going perfectly. Um, And I woke up in the middle of the night and was bleeding. Um, We rushed to the hospital, found out I had severe preeclampsia and they kept me stable for about three days and then had to deliver our daughter, Emma. Um, She was okay for about a day and then Unfortunately, she ended up passing away uh, the next day. They came down and said that she had little tears in her lungs and, you know, you guys need to come down and hold her. Um, and then it was pretty awful. I mean, it's not something you expect as a as a 28-year-old just to have your life shattered quite like that. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. And how was your husband doing through this? Um, we were both doing pretty bad, I think. Um, it was just, it was so unexpected. I mean, I remember lying in the hospital bed that night and just, I don't, I don't really even remember what happened. Um, I just remember that when we held Emma, we had about an hour with her before she passed and we looked at each other and said, we will not let this break us. Um, we had only been married for about a year and we said, we looked at our daughter and said, we will be stronger because of you and we will make it through this and we will do really great things with our life because you lived. Um, and we just made that promise to her. Talk about that grief a little bit, because so many of our listeners are going through loss like this and they feel very alone. They feel isolated and they feel so sad that the one thing that they feel like they should be able to do right is to have children has now been taken away from them. Yeah. Yeah. Get a little emotional. Um, it was really terrible, if I'm being really honest. I mean, I know people will say, like, oh, just get through it. Like, it'll be better on the other side. But it's awful to sit in that pain um, and that grief was probably the worst experience, definitely the worst experience of my entire life. Um, the most helpful thing that we did was a hospital referred us to a, an organization in Charlotte called Kindermorn um, that had therapy, but they also had groups of other parents who had lost children. And at that point, you know, we didn't really want to go to therapy, but we decided to reluctantly join this group. Um, And we ended up in this group with these other couples that just made us feel less alone. Mm -hmm. Everyone had a different story, had lost their baby a different way. Um, But we ended up becoming really great friends with all these people and are still friends with them to this day. And we're able to meet up with all of the rainbow babies. But I think the best thing it did for my husband was it let him connect with other husbands Mm -hmm. because men and women, women grieve so differently. I was you know, wanting to talk about it a lot. And he didn't want to talk about it. And it was really difficult, you know, for our relationship to go through that together. Did you guys have a baby room already ready? Um, It wasn't quite ready. We had all the furniture and it was painted and we had had a baby shower. Um, So right after she died, um, my in-laws came and took all the baby stuff out because we didn't want it there. 
and I had to call the furniture company to go get that back. And that was really terrible. Um, I think another thing that you don't think about is after your baby dies, you have to bury them. Um, so thankfully, this is all coming back to me now. <laughs> thankfully, my in-laws um, took care of that for us. But that was her funeral was a really traumatic experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, they had her in a room and we got to go see her, which in the end was like pretty healing to me. And, you know, we got to put a necklace in her in her casket and and all the things. But it was it was really terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and she's still out there and I can't go out there till this day. Um, I, it really upsets me and I just I can't go out there. But you don't think about, oh, I have to go by a funeral plot or I have to cremate my child. Um, it's just not it's not something you think about until it's you. Right. Especially you're not thinking about that when you're pregnant. Right. No. That's not no. going to happen. And you hadn't had any anything before that. Right. So what were people saying to you that was helpful? Um, Could anybody say anything to you? Not that was helpful. <laughs> I think I think you just have to know. And if you're somebody who is talking to someone who's lost, like there probably is nothing helpful that you can say. There's a lot of unhelpful things you can say. Um, you can, you know, the most unhelpful things were like, oh, well, she's in a better place or just think if she had lived at 27 weeks, she'd have all these challenges. And I'm like, I, I just wanted my baby here. Mm -hmm. um, or like, you'll have another baby. It will, you know, like, it'll be fine. You'll have another baby. Um, the most helpful things were people just sitting in it with me mm -hmm. and saying, I know this, this sucks. This really sucks. And just letting me cry. Um, I remember my mom sitting out on the porch with me and just letting me sob uh, for about, it was about a week after. And she stayed with me most of the time. But don't tell people that your kid is in a better place or you'll have another kid. Like that child that we were going to have or did have was our entire life. Mm -hmm. um, we had we had plans for her and a name and a nursery and those things. So at what point did you feel healed enough to think about <laughs> moving forward? Uh, we probably started thinking about having another child around like six months after, um, we had this silly inclination that having another child might help us heal. Mm -hmm. Um, and looking back, like that's not true. Um, I think you really have to sit in your grief and deal with your grief. Like another child will not help you heal. It will bring lots of other things into the picture. Mm -hmm. So about six months in and I had a C-section. So that's one of the they said we could try. We started trying. Um, and then we ended up getting pregnant again. Um, and we found out on Emma's first birthday. So on June 26th, um, that was crazy. Oh my gosh. Okay. So you're pregnant. Yep. And now what? We lose the baby. What? Yep. So we had a miscarriage. Um, and it was one of those terrible miscarriages where you go in and they're like, things aren't looking right. Come back in a week and then come back in a week and come back in another week. And eventually like the the heartbeat wasn't there anymore. So we lost that baby. Um, and that was, you know, it was a really odd thing because of course it was devastating, but it also healed me a little bit in a way because it happened on her birthday. I had been dreading her first birthday forever. Um, and it was almost like a wink from her to be like, it's going to be okay. And I can't explain like the feeling of calm and peace that it actually gave me, although it was terrible and we were very upset. Mm -hmm. um, but it just gave me a sense of, of calm for some reason. That's really interesting that yeah. that would heal you or make you feel comforted. I mean, to me, I'm like, oh, my gosh, no. Like, how much can one person take? How much can one family take? You know, and that loss is so, so hard. I have people say, oh, you know, adoptive parents don't experience any loss. It's the child or it's the mother. But I'm like, you need to listen to the show because a lot of this journey is built from loss on every side, right? And there's grief yeah. in it on every side. And so did you feel like maybe you weren't going to be able to carry a baby? I mean, what were the doctors saying? They said they had no idea why I had preeclampsia, that we had no family history. My body type wasn't that. They were assured that this was a one-time thing, that it would be fine. My mom had a really easy time getting pregnant had really easy pregnancies. Everyone was a little bit mystified as to why this had happened and another miscarriage had happened. Basically, they came back and like, well, you can try again. I'm like, I want to try again. 
Is, did you? So, we did. So we did. Um, I kind of had like a feeling something was off as we started to try and got tested for PCOS. And with all the grief we'd been through, like I just, I wasn't up to just like sitting there and waiting and trying. So we ended up doing five IUIs. Um, and the whole time we were doing IUIs, I had adoption in the back of my head. I had, you know, I've been, I'd listened to your podcast before, um, and been following Christian adoption consultants and knew that was a possibility, but my husband wasn't quite on board. And by the fifth IUI, I remember crying on the floor and him looking at me and saying, okay, let's adopt. Mm -hmm. Um, he said, I didn't realize like all the emotional turmoil this is causing your body. I just sort of thought you, you know, would take a pill and, you know, give yourself one shot but I didn't realize what this was doing to you. And like, I'm okay. And I feel comfortable that our baby is our baby and it doesn't have to be biological. And did you accept that too? Were you like, okay, let's do this? Yeah, I was ready. I was ready way before he was. I really don't think that people understand the toll on the body when you're trying to go through these, you know, fertility treatments. I mean, for me, like I take an aspirin and I'm loopy. Like I am so sensitive to anything that I I can't even imagine putting hormones into my body and, you know, all of those things that we're trying to change your body to get ready. And I think sometimes we just say like, oh yeah, it's just this thing that doctors can do, but it's, it's a lot. It's a lot on your marriage. It's a lot on the woman. And, you know, I'm just happy that your husband was like, okay, maybe this is another path for us. You know, maybe this isn't it. I think part of the fertility process to me too was it's like every time it didn't work it felt like another like it felt like the big loss we had again Mm -hmm. um it just like made the loss of emma like feel deeper and more hollow Mm -hmm. almost to that part of like why is this all happening to us like again and then just like every month you get really hopeful with fertility treatments because the doctors are saying it's a really great percentage and then it doesn't work again Mm mm-hmm when did you find adoption now? Like when did you start listening to the episodes? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. Um, probably it was probably within like a year after we probably like 2016 ish, 17, maybe, uh, the years, the years are fuzzy, but it wasn't, it wasn't too long after, um, our first miscarriage. So probably soon after that. One of the things that I like that you said in our pre-interview is that you felt like listening to other people helped you feel like it wasn't as big as you thought it was, or like these people are, these normal people are doing it. Mm-hmm. We can do this too. Yeah. So I, I think adoption to most people is this big mystery. Um, our daughter's older, so we don't really talk about her adoption story too much anymore because people don't really ask. Um, but anytime I mention that we adopted her, like the, they get these big eyes and are like, Oh my gosh, really? Like, like they just it's just this mystery that they don't understand but when you listen to all these stories of people who've done it it makes it seem feasible and possible um and that there are actually logical steps that you can take and you could say okay i i can do this too Mm -hmm. so what were those first steps so we reached out to christian adoption consultants and that was right after that was probably june-ish everything happens in june april (laughs) everything happens in june for us so it was probably june and um got in touch with casey and she told us that we knew we were planning on moving um, to South Carolina, which is honestly five miles from Charlotte. So we waited, had to wait till August to start our home study. Uh, so we started our home study in August and we were, I think we were home study approved by the end of September. And what year is this? 2017. 2017. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so then what did they tell you? You're going to wait on a list? They said, you know, it could be up to two years. We don't know. Um, The thing that I liked about Christian Adoption Consultants was that we could apply to multiple agencies and they only did agencies that had like a 48 hour waiting period. Um, I'm like a very proactive person and silly me that thought I could control anything (laughs) about this process. That was so cute of me. Um, But I was like, okay, let's let's apply to as many as we can um, and make sure that, you know, we have the best chance. Okay. So I love that you're saying this because these stories are so important because you could talk to somebody on their journey and they say, we used a consultant and it was terrible. It was not worth the money. Right. And now here you are like, we, we had a a great experience. This was what was meant to be. So I like hearing that because consultants across the board, 
aren't terrible, right? But you do need to do your research when you're you're bringing in another person that you're going to pay to help you in this process as well. And what they generally do is they take your home study from your state and then they look other places from state to state. So you have, I guess, a bigger pool to pull mm-hmm. from. So that's that's what they initially want, right? That's what they tell you is that they're going to do that. So you knew you could be mm-hmm. traveling. Yeah. So I think also when we started the adoption process, we, I mean, we know more now, but we honestly had no idea what we were doing. And we also weren't sure like which agencies were reputable. You know, you hear horror stories about agencies, but I felt like with, you know, by using the consultant that I knew was trustworthy, that they could point me in the right direction of reputable agencies. But yeah, so I think we applied to, it was Arizona, Colorado, Texas. um, And then they frequently sent us cases from Florida. So it would be, we would either get like a case from one of the agencies or we would get a case from the consultants, I guess, who had some lawyers that were working with in Florida. Okay. So how many placements happened in this time? Like how many times did they say, Hey, take a look at this? Oh, probably like seven or eight, I think, um, before, before that they were going to present you. Well, it was what they, they said, we have it like we have on a birth mom and here's the like here's the information we have about her if you want to present okay let us know and we'll present you is how they did it okay so for seven or eight times they presented and were you like oh my gosh it's we, did, we didn't know we didn't actually present so oh, we didn't okay move okay forward with all of them. there was a lot of cases like there were some that had like were like 38 weeks and you know we're drinking every day and just mm. things that we we weren't prepared for you know as parents okay so you okay so seven or eight but how many did you like wait for um we only presented twice Twice. so we presented the first time and it came it was a little girl in arizona um i still remember the profile and it came down they let us know it was down to us and another couple and they chose the other couple and oh my gosh um, it was devastating uh it's easy to talk about now but you know the thing about adoption um and I, i have a friend who also adopted that i went to college with and I like read something she wrote and she was like, talked about being on the front steps and getting the, the call. And she was just like, like adoption starts with a phone call. It doesn't start with the pregnancy test like you're used to. And the oh. fact that like you can get a phone call yeah. and your whole life has changed. Right. And you're sitting there waiting to figure out like, am I going to be parents or right. be parents like really soon? Like via phone call? Like right. really, it's, you know, really causes a lot of anxiety. You know, it's so funny that you bring that up because AJ just celebrated, my oldest just celebrated his 14th birthday. And every year we go through the story. And I don't know, this year, it struck me that we became parents in 24 hours. We had 24 hours to throw all this baby stuff in, you know, in a basket and like go. We didn't even know what we were doing. And that was, for me, it was very exciting. But when I tell AJ, he's like, you had hours. I'm like, imagine having hours to make a huge lifelong decision. Like for the rest of your life, this decision is going to change everything. That is a lot of pressure to think about. You're, but when you're in it, you're just kind of like excited unless yeah. you're not chosen. And then you're like, oh my gosh, like what's wrong with me? What didn't mm-hmm. we put in our book? I want to encourage you right now, if you're listening and you're new to this journey or you've had this happen before and you haven't been rematched, I want to tell you, adoption is a match. So if she did not pick you, she's not your birth mom that's going to be delivering. Let me just say that the right match is coming and you want to wait for that. You want to have what it takes to match with what she has. I'm telling you, it's just as important as matching with the baby, right? In this particular case of private infant adoption is that you want to get the right match. So if you're sad and you're like, I should have put the dog in there or like, I need to change my book. I I hear this all the time. I'm rearranging my book right now. And like, why did your life change? And they're like, no, but nobody's picking me. And I'm like, because your person isn't there yet. Don't rearrange your whole life and put different pictures. It's not the pictures. Don't worry. So I want to encourage you because that is really hard rejection and it's like you're like out there with your whole life hoping to become a parent and you just wonder if it's ever going to happen. After that, were you and your husband like, why is this so hard? I don't really, yes, but 
I sort of, you know, I have listened to your podcast and I like have it. You always say like your baby is coming. Like, you know, just hold on. Your baby is coming. And I just like kept that in my head and told my husband that I was like, we will like, we will be matched with the right. Like it's coming. We Were you like April says longer. this? Yes. I, was like, <laughs> I don't, you don't. To podcast. No, April. You need to hold on. <laughs> okay. So they didn't choose you. Not this whole we'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> April says it's going to be fine. He's like, what? It's fine. Okay. So next match, what were you looking for at this point? Were you like, okay, we will say yes to what? We were fairly open. Um, I think like we just, the drug exposure. So that's another like hard thing in a home study process. You have to answer a lot of questions that people don't have to answer when they have babies. And also it is really aggravating that you have to be like interviewed when other people like or not having to be interviewed to be parents. So you have to make decisions about race and you have to make decisions about drug exposure. And it's just like a lot of things that you wouldn't think, you know, you needed to decide. Um, but we were, for the drug exposure, we put like, you know, depends on the situation. So we would sort of just kind of look at the case mm. and think about like, Ooh. how would this impact the baby? And That's how good. would this impact the baby? And if it did, would we be okay with it? That is a great response. Depends. I like that. Because you're not saying yes, you're not saying no. But you're saying depends so that a lot of agencies don't like you to say no to anything, right? When this is a part of our coaching mm -hmm. is what we're doing as well as we're sitting down and saying, they're going to ask you these questions. So you need to think about them. And here's how you can say it in a way that's not going to make the agency mad at you. <laughs> and I like that. I like that you said that, that it depends. And uh, did you feel okay about disabled? You know, I don't really, I don't really remember that being being the question. I'm sure it was. Um, I feel like at that point in our life, we were probably not okay with that. Um, it was just a little bit too much for us. Mm -hmm. And just like we didn't with, you know, all the grief that we had had, we just didn't feel, you know, ready to, to do that. Okay, so talk about your match. What it came through? And what did it say? So, so we got the paper, Texas. Um, limited information on the birth mom. There was no picture. All it said was potential exposure before eight weeks. Um, it said that she was a swimmer in high school and um, a Jehovah witness. And it said that she was a Jehovah witness. Yeah. Was and was she looking um, for a Jehovah witness? No, she wasn't. She apparently not. Because okay. We're not. Okay. Um, apparently not. Um, and it mentioned that her reason for placement was that the birth dad was not her husband. Um, now there was a there was a lot more that went on that was probably the reason for placement, but that was what was written on the paper. Um, so anytime we got a case and we were going to present, we did talk to Casey um, at Christian Adoption Consultants and just like would go over like, hey, you've done this before. What mm -hmm. are the risks? And she felt like the risk because of the situation like wasn't wasn't terrible, and we were okay with like a potential exposure before eight weeks. So we we're like, let's let's just put. Let's put, let's present and see what happens. Okay. So she picks you. She does. She and then picks what? Me. Um, so we had an initial phone call with her, like I think the next day. I remember my husband and I took it like in um, the Harris Cheater parking lot because we have a beagle and he howls. And so we wanted to make sure that he wasn't howling during the call. Um, and we agreed that. So one of the, I think one of the things I was nervous about too was, um, how to communicate with birth mom because also didn't mention she was only 20 weeks pregnant at this point. Oh, um, right. Yeah. So we had a long journey. Right. Um, and you have to wonder like, are we supposed to talk all the time or are we not? But our social worker who connected us said, why don't you guys pick a day of the week and you connect on that day of the week. So we pick Sundays. Um, and then the agency in Texas also required us to fly out and meet her within two weeks. So we also flew out to Lubbock, Texas and met her. And how was that? Uh, a little awkward, if I'm being honest. Uh, I think I had heard, I was hopeful because I've heard a lot of stories and some on your podcast too about how, you know, you meet birth mom and it's just this like magical match and you're like, everything about us is the same and this is perfect. And it wasn't. And maybe I was just expecting it to be. I thought about that a little bit after our pre-interview. I was like, maybe I was expecting this, like, you know, this perfect match. But you have to have to know that this is somebody you don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, 
think about like what you would do on a first date or talk about on a first date. Like you don't know this person, you know, they know a limited amount about you. Um, and so it's, it's nerve wracking. What was she like? Uh, she was, she was really friendly. Um, I remember her walking into the restaurant and it's one of those things where you're like, do I, do I give her a hug or do I not? <laughs> it's, it's just like weird things going through your head and we brought her flowers. Um, and she, she was really nice. I mean, we, we didn't really talk about the baby or the pregnancy very much. I think it was just important to get to know each other, um, and establish a connection. I think, you know, as we get into the story, I think the connection that we built is one of the reasons why she ended up actually placing, Mm -hmm. um, even when things got a little shaky because we really got to know and trust each other. But we talked about, um, what she did growing up and we talked about her pregnancy cravings and that's still my daughter's favorite story that she craved cake um, in the middle of the night. And we talked about her friends and we talked about her work because her work was going really well. So just, just normal things that you would talk to a friend about getting to know. So you didn't talk about the baby. I think that's really important is you just let them lead the conversation. Most of the time, birth moms want to talk about themselves. They want to know that you love them, right? Not just about the baby, not just about, you know, what you're going to get from her, but that you really care about her. And when they bring up the baby, then yes, you talk about it. I mean, it's a natural conversation, but it's also very like a sensitive topic, right? So you're just there to get to know them and they want to know who you are. And so it sounds like you kind of just like found your way through that. And did she look pregnant? She's only 20 weeks. She did. Okay. She did. And this is Um, her, how many babies does she have? Her third baby. Her third. She was not parenting the other two. But oh, but she was married. Yes, but it's a but it wasn't. She, so she, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So she was married previously, and her ex husband parented the other two children. Okay, um, and she didn't have a whole lot of contact with them. Okay, gotcha. And so she is by herself right now at this point. She is. Yep. Okay. And did you feel confident that she was really going to place? I mean, she didn't seem. Um, no, I felt confident, but I think at that point when you're so in it that worrying doesn't help anything. Um, and I also think we were so naive uh, as like going through the adoption process the first time that we just kind of assumed that she would place um, and, and didn't consider, you know, what might happen if not. Um, and also like thinking about what could happen if she didn't place was just too a little much. too devastating for us. Yeah, yeah. Having lost a child before. Um, Cause even, you know, we found out it was a girl after we matched. And I remember going to get, we uh, my in-law saved all of the baby clothes we had. And I remember going to get the clothes and going in Target and feeling like this was healing a part of me mm-hmm. to have, you know, to have a girl and to do the things again. And the thought of that, like crashing was mm-hmm. just not okay. Did she know that you had experienced baby loss? Did she know your story? Is that in your profile book? She did, but it wasn't why she picked us. I don't mm. think she paid a lot of attention to that part because it was briefly mentioned. Um, because later she said, Oh, I remember seeing like a baby in your profile. Like, did you guys have a baby before? So she didn't. Okay. Read that wasn't that. why. Yeah. Why did she pick you? She said we looked fun. Um, <laughs> I, you do I've look never fun. Had anyone, I, I've never had anyone say I looked fun before, but <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> What about you was fun? What what kind of pictures did you have in there? I love that we had pictures like out doing things, like a picture at the beach or our dogs, um, out like at a baseball stadium. I think like she just liked seeing who we really were and what we really like to do. Um, we had we just we didn't really have a lot of stage photos in there or professional photos. I had a friend to, like take a couple for us like right before because we needed them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was mostly just it was just us like with family, with friends at the beach, doing being fun, doing fun things. Cause you guys are fun (laughs) people. (laughs) Well, that's fun. I mean, obviously she picked you because she wanted to give her child the life that she had wanted. Right. And there was something about you that she thought this is something that I'm doing good. I'm doing good by placing my baby with these fun people. And maybe in there, what you guys were doing were things that she would think would be fun. Right. I I find that a lot that birth moms often choose the life that they wish they would have had for their children. So they're looking for profile books. Like, 
I don't know if you heard the one story about the golden retriever, but she wanted a golden retriever growing up and she never got a golden retriever. And then she saw this family and they had a golden retriever and she's like, I want my child to have this golden retriever. And that's why she picked up the golden retriever. So right. you never know what's going to actually bring, you know, the, the match together. But like you said, being as authentic and honest in your book is super important. So you, you meet her. It wasn't like, oh, but you yeah. guys are talking every Sunday, and is she telling you about her her appointments? She is. She was very sweet and sent us ultrasounds, mailed them to us. Um, we actually got to be really good friends over the twenty weeks. We ended up talking more than just Sundays. Honestly, she we she and I mostly talked. Um, she didn't really chat too much with my husband, but you know we texted often and, and talked often, and really got to be pretty good friends over the time. And she's still. A Jehovah's Witness, like at that time, was she asking you yeah. like about religion or anything? Um, she asked us if we like were religious at all. She said, basically said, like, are you religious? And then she said, not that it matters to me. So, and what'd you say? That was interesting. I said, yeah, I said we're Christian. Um, and she said, okay. And that was sort of the end of that conversation. Oh, and you weren't like, tell me about being a Jehovah's Witness. Oh, I didn't know how. I don't know how delicately you ask about that. Right. <laughs> she did right. talk. She did talk about it a little bit, and we read a lot about it because we didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, but she did talk about it a little bit, like while we were at lunch. She was pretty open about that. Okay, so let's talk about when she's going into labor. Did you mm -hmm. have a plan? Like you were going to fly out there? Were you going to be in the room? What was the plan? Uh, the plan was that she, we would not be in the room when she gave birth. Um, Obviously, as soon as she knew she was in labor, our plan was to fly out there. And she ended up going into labor at like 11 or 12 o'clock at night. The one night I left my phone downstairs and the one night I fell asleep peacefully. <laughs> and then I wake up at three in the morning and I get my phone and I have all these missed calls and texts from her, like frantic calls as well saying like, I'm in labor. Do you guys still even want this baby? And it was really scary. Oh my it was gosh. really scary. It was three in the morning. I can't get in touch with her. I call the social worker. We throw things in suitcases because we haven't packed yet. I don't know why we didn't pack. It was like five days before she was due. Um, and we raced to the airport without tickets. And we got to the counter and said, we don't have tickets. And they looked at us like we were crazy. Oh my gosh. This is <laughs> my favorite part of the story because it's like, what is this? Like 1960? You're yeah. like, I need a ticket. Here's some cash. <laughs> they were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like who comes to the airport without tickets? I'm like, we do. We're can like, we buy them here? Yeah. So but do they sell didn't. tickets at the, I mean, I don't even know. What do they say to you? Uh, they were really nice and helped us out. But the reason we had to do that was because you couldn't buy them online at like three in the morning for that morning. So we were trying to fly out, like get the six or seven o'clock flight and you couldn't actually get them online. Like they didn't open until like a little bit later. Okay. Once we told them that we, that we were adopting, they were very sweet and helped us out. But their initial, like, I've never seen, like, someone that shocked on their face. <laughs> and we had, like, a car seat and we had, like, suitcases. Wait, you were going to take an empty car seat? You were yeah, traveling with we were. the empty car seat? We did. Yeah, we did because we had one from our previous People our previous were probably like, these people are crazy. There's these no baby crazy. in there. Do they know there's no baby? They forgot their baby. They crazy. Yeah, they 100% thought we were crazy. Okay, so most people buy it when you land. You guys were like, we don't have time for better, that. We are, we got to get there. That was probably a better idea, but, and we also ended up bringing the wrong base, so we had to buy a new one anyway. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so you're traveling. You got your ticket at the counter. Mm -hmm. They sold it to you, and when did you get there? We got there about – we got to the hospital about 1 o'clock, so our baby was born at about 8.30 in the morning. And we had a layover, so we found out on the layover that she had been born. Um, we didn't get pictures, but birth mom told us she was born and she was doing well. And then we pulled up to the hospital, and then while we're in the parking lot, I got a text from her, and she was like, oh, I forgot. I probably should have sent you a picture. So she sent this picture while we're in the parking lot. Um, we went in and got her some flowers and went up to her room. And I have never been more scared in my life mm. walking into a hospital room. It's not even meeting your baby. It's just... It's a very sensitive situation, um, and it's just it's one of those things where you like don't ever expect that you're ever going to be in a situation like that. It's just um, awkward, right? Because you're it's like really awkward. You don't know your place. You don't want to be too forward, but you don't want to be weird because she's already feeling probably like I need you to, you know, I need mm -hmm. a re this relationship that we have. But then you're, 
it is, it's hard. It's really hard. The hospital situation can be filled with anxiety. Yes. And I had read a lot like that and all like maybe probably some of your podcasts too, that like things can be going great, but a lot of times things change at the hospital. And did they? Um, they did. Oh no. So, yeah. So originally it was great. So we walked in and I had like read, like I went straight to the birth mom, like babe, uh, Baby was in a little back Ooh, that, but I went straight. You to did her the right sure thing. Okay, you did the right thing. Yeah. So I, I, you went I heard straight that to her. The right thing to do. Yeah, like go straight to her, make sure she was okay, and we talked to her, and then she was like, "Well, the baby's over there. Don't you want to see her?" And I was like, "Oh yes, I probably should have asked." You're so like, "Oh baby, what? Yeah. Baby, what baby?" <laughs> um, we sat in the room with her for several hours um, and talked with the baby. And then the were you holding the baby? Up. She's holding the baby. Um, either my husband or I, or sometimes she would, it just kind of went back and forth. Okay. Um, and then we ended up getting our own room at the hospital and she wanted to rest. So we were able to take baby back, um, and, and have a little time with her. Was the hospital nice to you? They were so nice. Okay. They were so nice. Yeah. Well, that's great. So they um, were supporting the whole thing. They were. And were, um, was so your agency there or somebody, some social worker? Um, the social worker was delayed. She <sighs> was having a hard time getting there. So she didn't get there probably until like the very end of that day, um, which was unfortunate. Oh no. What happened? Um, so first day was great. Um, the second day was such a blur. Uh, I even thought about it the other day. My mom was like, I, you just went like dark. I didn't hear anything from you because my mom had flown out there. Um, and she was like, I just didn't hear a word. So she started thinking she might change her mind. Um, Apparently, the people at the Jehovah's Witness community didn't know she was placing. Um, she had had a baby shower with them, and a couple people from there came out to talk to her and told her to not place, that she should not be placing outside the religion. And then at that point, um, she also was just thinking about parenting. And she was also texting with her husband, and they were saying, oh, she's so cute, like, maybe we'll keep her. Um, and at one point, she even just left the hospital for a little while. What? Um, and when she, yeah, she just left the hospital. Can they leave the hospital? I don't think they can leave the hospital. Well, so I didn't know what was going on. Then CPS got involved. Oh, and that, shoot. And so then CPS were you like, your agency room. needs to come? Well, agency was there at, the po- at that point. Oh, okay. But she had left the hospital. CPS got involved. And then they started like making her nervous with things. And then I started to freak out a little bit because I'm just like, leave her alone. Like, leave her alone. Like, this is too much. And at that point, things just spiraled. Okay, so things are spiraling and you are nervous. Do you have the baby? Where's the baby if she left? When she left, the baby was in the room. Nobody was in the room. We were in another room. So she left with the baby in the room, which is probably why CPS got involved. Okay. And did you ever have the baby with you in your room? We did. We okay. Did. We had the baby the first night. Oh, you did. Um, and then she, yeah. So she would like text us when she wanted baby back, um, or we'd hang out with her in her room. But at that point, yeah, she left with the baby in the room while we weren't there. Oh my gosh, I, I I think about the times that this has happened to us, and how much having an education and what to do in this situation can really make or break the adoption, right? Because your initial feeling is like sort of anger. You're like, are you kidding? Like, what are you going to choose? We went this long journey and, and I want to be a parent. And you're thinking about all these things. And so you initially become sort of shut down, right? Because you're like, I want out of the situation. I I would like to go home. I don't even want to get on this roller coaster. And if she's going to parent, let her parent. If CPS is here, let. that's how I am. I'm like, shut it down, go home, which is literally the worst thing you can do. This is the time when you have to be something that is beyond you. And I love that you did that. Like you dug deep and you're like, I know enough from all of the things I've read and podcasting. I know enough that I'm going to have to act in a way that's opposite of how I'm really feeling. Talk to us about that. Unfortunately, I didn't. (laughs) So unfortunately. (laughs) You did come around though. We did get there, right? I wasn't angry, but I was worried about the birth mom. Like we had gotten to know each other and I didn't want 
CPS in there, like giving her a hard time and making this horrible, this big decision that she was going to make worse. And at that point, I just started crying. And actually, the social worker looked at me and she snapped me back in place. And she was like, stop. This is the worst thing you can do right now. You cannot do this. And I was like, okay, and pulled it together. Oh, she told you not to cry. Okay. Yeah. She was like, this is the worst thing that like the, she, the birth mom can see you do. But eventually it actually ended up helping a little bit because later the social worker told birth mom, the reason she was upset is because she was so worried about you. Like she wanted to make sure you were okay. And which is true. Okay. So at what point does she get to ha- make that final decision? Like what is the signing in Texas? It's 40, 48 hours. Okay. So So the night before she's supposed to sign, um, my husband had gone out to get another car seat because brought brought the wrong car seat. And she came in my room and told me that she was thinking about parenting. Um, I remember that conversation so vividly. And she was like, she was even like, I'll pay you back. Like, it's and and I had to do the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my whole life while I was holding this beautiful baby girl is to say, if you choose to parent, we will not be angry with you. We will support you. Like you will be doing a really brave thing. I said, I love this baby and I would love to parent her, but like, this is your choice. And like, we will not harbor any bad feelings towards you. And that was the hardest thing I've ever had to say, but I knew for my child that I had to say that out loud. Mm -hmm. Like it's still like, I still get chills thinking about that conversation and, and mustering the strength to say that. Mm-hmm. And, and really meaning it, you know, yeah, really I being really like, I have come to the place where this resonates and I have to be okay with this. And I know that, you know, my story, but if I had done that with one of the children, I believe that we had a better chance at having him but because I didn't know how to deal with those emotions and I was so terrified, I just shut down. And I really wish that I, no matter how it turned out, that I had said to her, you know, we love you and we're concerned about you. And you know, we were here to adopt your baby, but we're not taking him. We can do this together. But you don't, you I mean, I, she wasn't going to get him. He was going to go into the foster care system. So let him have a mm-hmm. home. Like, just at least, like, reach out and be loving, even though I feel so upset, right? And I'm, like, about to be devastated. And that, mm-hmm. I think, is, it's, like, I'm, like, so proud that you did that and that you took the advice of, you know, all these people who have gone before you and said, yes, like, I had to do this. Because that's not a natural thing. It really isn't natural. And you, was your husband like, no. what? Or was he on board too? He wasn't, like, he wasn't in the room. Oh. He, he was out. He was out buying the car seat. So he wasn't in the room. And I think that, I think that was good because I think like we needed, the two of us need to just have like a heart to heart talk. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that was good. I'm not really sure if I ever told him about that part. Oh, we'll, well he's out. about to find out. <laughs> he will. He'll know now. <laughs> okay. So he comes back. And you have this conversation and then what happened? So baby was in our room again. Um, birth mom comes storming in our room at 3 a.m. while we're all asleep, throws all of the baby stuff down that she has. And she says, I was about to come in here and tell you that I was keeping baby. Um, but I just decided I'm not and I don't want to see baby again. And here's all of her stuff at That's 3 in the morning. 3 a.m.? Were you like, what? happening yeah yes basically what's happening like yeah 3 a.m um but you can't sign until 9 a.m the next morning so did you feel like you were on now you said this when you applied your friend had told you being in the adoption journey feels like a roller coaster of like up and down did you feel like you were just a part of the roller coaster like maybe tomorrow morning that was going to be different honestly at this point I didn't know what was happening I thought there was a pretty good chance she still didn't place. Um, but yeah, my friend had told me it's like a roller coaster that keeps going that keeps going down until until it's over. <laughs> it's, it keeps going down. Like yeah, it wasn't up and down, it was just it keeps going down. <laughs> it's a roller coaster over. that's just down. <laughs> it just goes down a lot. People um, listening to this are like, What? It it is a lot of because you're dealing with humanity. This is not a transaction. You're dealing with emotions. You're dealing with something that is so close to people's hearts. Children, babies, 
that's hard to, to control. You can't control it. You have no control. Mm -hmm. And so you just go in and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm on this roller coaster and we are going down and we have till nine o'clock to decide. So what happens at nine? Um, she actually texted us right before at nine and said that she wanted baby back in the room. So we brought baby in there and it just turned out that they were starting to, so I guess they make, they read it out loud and they make the birth mom read it too, like mm -hmm. out loud. So she fully understands what she's doing. Um, so we walked in there like, you guys can't be in here. So we left baby in the room and we went back to our room. Um, and to this day, like, I still think about my sweet daughter and her being in that room while she heard her mom give away her rights. Um, it's a lot. Um, I know she was a baby, but there's a lot of loss for her. And yeah. that's, you know, that's a lot. So was the baby healthy? Yeah, she was very healthy. What, how much did she weigh? Do you remember? Um, 7, 13, I believe. Aw, so she was little. And yeah, she was little. did you know what you were going to name her? We did. Um, so we named her Elizabeth Lindsay after my mom, uh, but we call her Liza. Uh, and did birth mom like that name? She did. She liked Elizabeth uh, for sure because it was uh, religious. Oh, okay. For her. Yeah. And so she's reading her rights away. I know that is really painful to think about. And I'm glad that you understand that, that loss is there even though she was a baby there's still loss we like to say or pretend sometimes that you know if we adopt from birth that they kind of skipped over that and mm -hmm. yes there's a lot of benefit to getting a baby right away but there's still loss right and and you recognize that and sympathize with that but she did sign the paperwork at she nine. oh my she gosh oh my gosh so the baby was yours and then what did she do she laughed well then well, we went back in the room um, and she was going to have like an additional surgery. So we sat with her until then. Um, and then when she left and we went back to the room um, to get discharged. And the moment we walked in the room, I just started sobbing, like sobbing out of just pure relief that like everything we've been through for the last few years, that like we, like we had a baby like mm -hmm. this, like we made it actually. <laughs> My friends will remember this. I called a couple of my friends to tell, to tell them that, that she had signed. And they saw me crying. And they're like, oh, my God. They're like, don't ever do that to me again. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. I didn't even think about These that. These are tears of joy. This is joy. <laughs> These are tears of joy. I'm not upset. Um, they were like, you just, like, gave me a minor heart attack. Uh, but, yeah, then we got discharged and stayed in Texas for two weeks for ICPC. And then you took your baby home. And, and then we took her home. Do you have an open adoption? We do. Um, we stayed in pretty close contact for about a year. Um, and then she sort of disappeared. Um, about every year or so we'll hear from her, um, for maybe a different phone number or honestly, we don't know where she's living. Um, but you know, we're open to her and to building a relationship. And when, um, Liza gets to that age and wants a relationship, I hope that's something that they'll be able to have. Mm -hmm. Um, I really do hope that for her. That, that she can have a relationship because I know that would, you know, be a healing part to her journey. But the story continues. Tell us what okay. happened. It does. Um, so we finalized her adoption in November of that year, which I believe was still 2018. Um, and then on New Year's Day, we find out that we're pregnant um, with our son, Drew. Oh my gosh. Crazy. Um, chills all around uh, for that one. And she, Drew was actually due um, about a week from when our original child was due, Emma. So they were due around the same time. We found out we were pregnant around the same time. Um, I remember Eliza being in um, her high chair and that's just like laughing together because we were like, we've been through all of this stuff and now we're gonna have two under two. <laughs> How did this happen? Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. And were you nervous through that pregnancy or were you just focused on the baby that you had? I was pretty nervous. Um, I don't, it was a pretty, it felt like a pretty traumatic pregnancy. First, I was really sick the whole time, um, but I just kept wondering if something was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people kept saying, oh, like, it's fine, nothing's going to happen. 
and I went into the doctor and they said, perfectly healthy pregnancy at this point, just you're going to be very pregnant. And then the next week my blood pressure went up. Um, and I went to the hospital three days later, I started having like pain in my chest overnight. And at 7 a.m., they told me basically my organs were shutting down and the baby was coming right now. And this was June 20th. So Emma oh was gosh. born on June 26th and Drew was born on June 20th. So I remember the C-section just holding my husband's hand the whole time, thinking and looking at him and us thinking, I can't believe this is happening again. Mm-hmm. Like, I cannot believe it. Please, just please don't die. So. And he lived. And he did. And we got to hold him for the first time mm-hmm. on her birthday on June 26th. Um, and the same Nikki that she died. And oh I just gosh. feel like that was, yeah, I just feel like that was a gift from her um, to to have that. And because we knew that was going to be a hard day. And the fact that I got to to put a place in on my chest for the first time that day, oh that many gosh. years later. So amazing. Such a redemptive story. It doesn't mean that there isn't grief, right? That's still there. But just the way that it worked out that, You have two beautiful children. How old are they now? Six and five. Six and five. And we have to end this, but I would love for you to give your advice for someone who is possibly just starting their journey and maybe starting their journey after a big loss like you experienced. What's what's your best advice for them? Um, I think after the loss, and this is this is the advice we were given, and I didn't want to get this advice. So this is advice people are not going to want to get, but take time to heal and to grieve and to sit with it because adoption is hard and there's a lot of loss that goes into it. So just take the time to, to heal with the loss. And the first thing that after like Emma died, we thought we just want to have another baby to fix this Mm -hmm. and it doesn't fix anything. So just take the time to heal before you start the process. And then I think with the process, just keep an open mind and an open heart and focus on loving the birth mom as much as you can, as hard as it is to just to be there for her and know that and know that in the end, it will work out. Um, you like you say your baby is coming and like you will have your baby. And we have Liza and she is amazing. And she is so different from me and my husband. She's like everything I wish I was when I was a kid. She's like, she's cool going. She's cool and social <laughs> and outgoing. She's like, you know, she'll be one of the cool kids. And I'm like, I was so shy and introverted. So she's, she's just amazing. Ah, I love that so much. I love this match. And I love that she loves her story. And we'll be here as she's growing up to help with those questions that she's asking. And I know she started asking some questions. And, you know, we are here to help with that, too. Like, how do you answer? And how do you be loving, mm-hmm. especially when you have a, a biological child, right? She's probably like, wait a second. And, and you said that Drew is like, wait, how old is he? She loves she he's five. He's she five. loves he's, her story. And he's she like Where's she was, my second mom? Well no, she told Drew, she said, she was like, I'm cooler than you because I have two moms. Oh. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, but Mackenzie, thank you so much for joining the show and sharing mm-hmm. your story. Thanks for having me. And I have to tell you that we were at the beach last weekend and I looked at my husband and I was like, She asked if we'd adopt again. And I was like, so and he was like maybe he's like and i was just like the, all the time in april i don't know i'm just thinking about it more Ooh. so we'll see okay keep us in the loop i will thank you so much for nearly a decade adoption now has shared inspiring adoption stories now go behind the scenes enjoy bonus content and connect with our adoption community join us on patreon at patreon.com adoption now or get one-on-one coaching at adoptionnowpodcast.com. If this episode moved you, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok. See you next episode. At the end.